And it's Amos. Famous Amos. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. In 1976, 13 visionary women came together to form CMC to connect people and ideas through community conversation. 48 years later, that conversation is still going strong. Yes, 2024 is CMC's 48th year of community conversations. Let's have a hand for the CMC, why not? CMC explores public policy issues, current events, and spotlights lessons and leaderships at forums like this one every week from its beginning, CMC has welcomed everyone. I'm Doug Buchanan, I'm Editor-in-Chief of Columbus Business First. I'm also proud to serve on your CMC Board of Trustees and I'm also Chair of the Program Committee, which serves as CMC's Editorial Board. So if you like the topics that we're having, please let me know that. Uh, if you don't, there's another Doug Buchanan right at the back there and uh, he would love to hear all about your complaints. Uh, for those of you joining us by live stream, we're coming to you today from our beautiful home in historic Italian village, the Ellis. Uh, let's begin as we always do by welcoming new CMC members. Ellis Burgess, Caitlin Kendall Sperry, and Jenny Bergman with Benefactor Group, Allison Ivan with Myers and Associates, Sarah Irvin with Irvin Public Relations, Magali Linares with Red One Realty, Brenda Rivers with the Childhood Development Council of Franklin County, Ellen Sweeney, and in the audience today, Tom Mowbray with North Central Mental Health Services and Ryan Dieter with Key Realty. Let's have a hand for all of our new members. If you're not already a member, it's easy to become a member. Uh, CMC is opening to everyone, and uh, if you support us, you're playing a key role you're, uh, in supporting civil discourse in Central Ohio. All you have to do is visit Columbus Metro club.org to join. And if you scan the QR codes at your table, you'll see the many generous organizations that support your not-for-profit Columbus Metropolitan Club. We would not exist without their support. I want to thank today's forum sponsors, Moody Nolan and Burgess and Naipel. And thank you to our host, The Ellis, for its general, generous support. And we're also grateful to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting our live stream being carried on CMC's social media platforms. Let's thank everyone for supporting today's forum. Okay, on to today's forum. What makes a city beautiful, livable, walkable, and simply a desirable place to call home? And on the other side, what makes uh, what mistakes can de destroy a city's appeal to residents, visitors, and investors? For the last six years, 
Cal Poly Assistant Professor of City and Regional Planning, Dave Amos, has been exploring answers to these questions through a hugely popular YouTube channel called City Beautiful. The channel embraces a simple mantra that cities are amazing. Amos's inquisitive and fast-paced style has earned his channel more than 650,000 subscribers, which is remarkable for a channel on that subject, so that's great. Uh, his videos about cities and city planning regularly attracting millions of views. And Dave is not alone in his love for cities, as we'll find out from today's expert panel. Please help me give a very warm CMC welcome to today's esteemed panel. First on my left here, Dr. Dave Amos, Assistant Professor with the Department of Regional Planning City, I'm sorry, Department of City and Regional Planning at Cal Poly in St. San Luis Obispo. You should, yeah, yeah well, you should just give your own. Uh, San Luis Obispo, California. There yep. we go. And Dr. Manuel Santano Palacios, Assistant Professor of City and Regional Planning with the School of Arch Knowlton School of Architecture at the Ohio State University. And our host, Belkus Schoenhals, the principal planner for our very own city beautiful, the city of Columbus. Belkus, we're thrilled to have you, and we look forward to today's conversation. How about a round of applause? Hi, everyone. So good afternoon, all. Um, thank you all for being here today as we explore what factors shape the cities we call home and what makes a city beautiful. For me, I find beautiful in two places. One, my home of Columbus, and also in my second home of Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic, where my family's from. Columbus is beautiful in that it centers its initiative on equity and building a city where we can all live, travel, work, and be in community in ways that bring us dignity, security, and opportunities for growth. We have beautiful historic neighborhoods, public art, and extensive metro park system where I love to hike on the weekends. Santo Domingo is also a gem. It bustles with life and many opportunities for connection, eyes on the street as Jane Jacobs first coined. There are colmados or bodegas on nearly every corner and they offer a third place where you can not only buy platanos and yuca, but you can also relieve loneliness and chat and play dominoes. There's density, colorful, bright buildings, housing types of all shapes and sizes with balconies, and beautifully preserved historical colonial district. There's also a robust metro system, which is the largest metro system in the Caribbean and Central America. And I, all you ho I, all, I hope that all of you get to visit one day. I'm pleased to personally welcome Dave Amos and Manuel Santana Palacios, and I thank you both for offering your insights today. So in keeping with the theme of today's forum, Creating the City Beautiful, what do each of you think makes a city beautiful and how do you create a beautiful city? Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. This is my first time in Columbus. I, I led a sad life before this. I've never been to Columbus before. Uh, and I'm so excited to be here um, and uh, get to, uh, a chance to check out this amazing city. Um, what makes a city beautiful? Um, I don't know. Manuel and I were talking a little bit about this beforehand because it's such a good question. It's sort of broad, but it really makes you think. Um, and I think one of the things you can I think we want to challenge the notion of beauty in a way. Um, there's a lot, a lot of different ways to see beauty in a place. Um, I think we naturally go to the aesthetics, right? Like, oh, you know, like this building is historic and you know cherished and and beautiful. And uh, but I think uh, we need to look a little bit deeper. And I think some of our my fondest memories in cities are not looking at a beautiful piece of architecture, um, but you know, strolling through a walkable place uh, where I can actually go get ice cream with my kids, then go into a shop, and then go do something else. Right? Like this sort of accessibility factor is really important. Um, another thing I think about when I think about beauty is 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 just again beyond the notion of beauty and thinking about uh, some of the major challenges cities are facing right now. We're, you know, we're thinking about uh, how do we make a city affordable and accessible to everyone? How do we make it equitable to everyone? Right? And how do we make it sustainable in the face of climate change? So, like, uh, I think the the good thing is uh, when we start tackling those problems, uh, we actually sort of achieve a greater beauty um, if we start thinking about those problems. But I'll stop there because I could keep going. Yeah. No. And now that you mentioned accessibility, there are like two. 
like two uh, different definitions of accessibility. What Dave was just like talking is about access, like this idea that we can just like reach places, and and to um, to think about like this idea of what's beautiful, like you know, like beyond uh, aesthetics. It's like for me, a city that is beautiful is a place that you can enjoy yourself, a place that you can experience and that brings you joy. That is that brings uh, like these positive uh, reactions to life and and to to exchange with uh, with other uh, communities and with your own community. And I guess that that is more about function uh, to put at the forefront, and then aesthetics maybe uh, comes later. And I've been thinking about like this idea of you know like like why is it why we like like how to how to uh, use perhaps a different term than beautiful to talk about you know like what we need to see our cities to be. Yeah, to add on to that, I just uh, I mean I th like I think when I think about Paris, for example, we think of that as a quintessentially beautiful city, but is it beautiful because you know all the facades are coordinated on the Haussmann boulevards, or is it beautiful because it structurally provides enclosure because they allow density, they allow people to live on that street, they're shopping uh, along the street, there's transparency, right? So it's not so much that we have to have like matchy-matchy architecture or some sort of prescriptive urban form, but the function of Paris works and it results in a beautiful form, which I, I, I just wanted to add that in because I felt like maybe my answer was a cop out by redefining beautiful and changing the whole question <laughs> but uh th that's yeah. yeah yeah and then the other question uh to add to the question is like beautiful for whom uh. and it all depends on you know like where you live and how you experience the city and that that comes that bring us to issues about equity or social justice as well which i think is our uh fundamental uh for these days no i think those are really great points and you know, thinking of beauty and not just form, but also function. And then how can people access that form and function? How do they access them maybe differently or together? So um, definitely some some themes we'll touch on later as well. Um, but just kind of learning more about both of you. I know we're all interested in your backgrounds, but what brought you guys into city planning? And, you know, what media you're inspired by? Books, podcasts, TikTok. Um, what are you inspired by? What uh, brought me to city planning? Yeah. So, I'm a civil engineer by practice, and um, I'm from Colombia. And I worked after I finished. I did a master's in transportation engineering. So I work as a public transportation engineer slash planner. Uh, when I was in Bogota, and I was um, trying to, I mean, working uh, redesigning uh, many public transportation systems across Latin America. Uh, but I always had this curiosity to understand what are the connections of transportation and land development, urban form, how this, what are the mechanisms behind, you know, like these two um, elements that, that are like so important for cities. And that's what uh, brought me uh, into the field of city planning. Cool. And uh, recommendations. I'll I'll go. I'll get into that after day. So. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I figured out I want to be a city planner fairly early on in life. Uh, like so many things, I have a public school teacher to thank for my sort of trajectory in the world. Um, I had a great government teacher when I was in high school who uh, realized that I had a, an interest and a knack for that subject and recommended a book. The book is now 25 years old, but uh, it, was, it was called Natural Capitalism. And in it, it was sort of about how we sort of can reform capitalism and be more sustainable. And in that uh, book, it had a chapter on uh, Curitiba, Brazil, and sort of the things that they were doing, innovative uh, transportation networks, doing more with less. Uh, and it made me realize, wow, like there are people whose job it is to like make a positive impact tangibly in people's lives in the cities where they live. And I was like, Sign me up. So um, pretty quickly after that, I, uh, I got a bachelor's degree in urban studies from Cornell University, and then eventually went and got a master's in architecture and city planning at the University of Oregon, became a consultant planner. So I got to learn how to do and do uh, general plans or comprehensive planning for communities across California uh, before going back and, and meeting uh, Manuel at Berkeley, uh, getting a PhD. And now I'm a professor. And what, what media inspires both of you? Any books or podcasts that we could pick up and tune into? Uh, I mean, one, we were just like talking uh, with Belkis about the, 
the death and life of the great Ameri of great American cities uh, by uh, Jane Jacobs. Uh, that's one of my favorites. And I'm actually looking again at the book because I'm teaching a class on transportation land use. Nice. So, so there is one one chapter uh, in the class that students have to read. And podcasts I like and 99% Invisible. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. So I'll give two recommendations. One is the recommendation, like the book that I have all my freshmen read in their intro planning class. I can recommend this to you. It's called Crabgrass Frontier by Kenneth Jackson. Uh, it's basically a history book. It's the history of suburbanization in the United States. To understand cities today, you really need to understand how cities suburbanized, uh, how a house and a yard became the ideal in the U.S. cities, uh, how we sort of regulated that, created policies around that, developed transportation around that, uh, and that symbiotic relationship between land use and transportation. So if you want to read one book, I think that explains U.S. cities uh, in a really succinct way, I think it's, it's Crabgrass Frontier. The uh, second piece, less nerdy maybe, uh, I'll give, I'm a YouTuber, I'll give another YouTube recommendation. My favorite uh, YouTube channel, and I think this might be like the YouTubers YouTuber kind of for city planning is uh, the channel About Here. Um, it's by Ute Lee. Uh, he does his work out of Vancouver, BC. Um, he uh, again, as somebody who has to make videos on a regular basis, I just am jealous by how effortlessly he presents this information in a, a really fun and engaging way. And I'm like, how do you how do you do that? So uh, go check him out. He's so good. I think we'd argue that you do the same with your YouTube videos. So, um, but speaking of that, how did you start your YouTube channel, Dave? And why did you title it City Beautiful? Yeah, so I think the first germ of the idea came in like 2013. I was a new city planner. I was doing that consultant land use planning stuff. And one of my, one of my tasks for my job was uh, briefing community members on like boards and commissions um, about like planning topics. Like we'd be doing a general plan or a comprehensive plan. And this month we'd have to talk about complete streets. And the next month would be healthy communities. And I always wish there were just YouTube videos I could send them like ahead of time. Like just go watch this video, then we can go meet and you got, you're all briefed on it. But at the time there wasn't really anything out there. Uh, so I had to sit there and make these presentations myself and it took forever. Um, and then, but I, so I socked that away in my mind. And then when I was, um, uh, a PhD student, I taught intro to city planning to undergraduates, and I couldn't help but think a lot of this content, I mean, it, it was interesting to them, I hope, they didn't get too bored in my class, but uh, I thought it was of relevance to people outside of academia. Um, and I figured, well, if nobody's made these videos, uh, maybe I should be the one to do it. Um, so uh, I, it's been seven years ago I started, and I made the goal, I'm going to make one video per calendar month. And I'll see how it goes. And uh, I've seven years later, I've never missed a month. Uh, and it, so it just, it just kept making the videos and uh, kind of took off. That's amazing. That's great. Um, pivoting a little bit, um, I guess, from your City Beautiful YouTube channel to the City Beautiful movement, um, it was a US social reform movement focused on city beautification. Uh, it was led by the upper middle class, concerned with poor living conditions. And in the decades that followed, whole neighborhoods were demolished for the sake of these aesthetic ideals. This top-down approach did not work. And now we're seeing this push-pull effect between having dynamic quality architecture and a focus on equity and housing supply, kind of what we were talking about with beauty earlier. Um, so where do you both think this balance is between high quality design and architecture in light of our focus on equity and goals surrounding housing? Well, can I just first say that I, I don't want to endorse the City Beautiful movement by the... <laughs> uh, so I, I, my, the reason I named the City Beautiful channel City Beautiful was just because um, at that time, if you looked on YouTube and looked for city planning content, you most often got people who would like um, drive into like... Uh, poor areas of cities and point out how dangerous it was and how bad cities were. Uh, so the channel is a response to that narrative that cities are somehow uh, a problem when I see cities as the solution to many of our problems. So that's why I totally understood the, 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 the fact that I was tying my, hitching my wagon to a, 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 a older uh, planning idea that I don't ascribe to. Um, okay. But so, so would you want to go on to the, you want to take the next part of that? Uh, no, thank you. I was always curious. <laughs> so, and and for the record, I just discovered that 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 they, I mean, I discovered that they was like uh, creating these YouTube videos when we were doing the PhD, and I think we were already in our like second or third year. I don't remember. And and yeah, so I was like, how 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 you could do it? <laughs> like, and then, then you were like. Uh, raising your kids and doing the dissertation, and now you and now he has city beautiful. 
Uh, but to, to, to your point on the balance. Yes, between. on the balance. I, I mean, I wanted to say something first and, and like something that I, that I value, of course, uh, without like, without negating all the negative uh, consequences of, of this approach to, to planning is that one of the tenants of the City Beautiful movement was to uh, create places that people could enjoy. It was kind of like a social, you know, like like the cities as this social good. Yeah. And, and then as a result, like many parks were built. Yeah. And, but then, but then at the expense of uh, lower income communities in some cases, and then we saw like urban displacement and 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 that followed uh, the urban renewal movement mm -hmm. here in the United States, which we all know what the you know what the negative effects are. And then to the question how we balance those two, you know, like uh, the aesthetics, the aesthetics, but and then the, with like equity and our need for housing yeah. supply today. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's the million dollar question. I would say that one of the of the things that actually Columbus is is on the right path on doing is uh, it's a re um, like re like updating the zoning code. So mm -hmm. that's one of the of the initiatives that I think are very important. Investing in transit mm -hmm. more is another one. And again, like making sure that those those two uh, elements uh that we have as planners in our you know as, as in our toolbox we yeah. can coordinate those two in order to make our city accommodate growth in a better way and also if possible to uh help communities to better connect to each other and and in a way um overcome the barriers that many of those uh, mm -hmm. urban renewal initiatives created so like finding beauty through access kind of yeah i would say so okay Nice. Great. Well, you know, in kind of speaking with themes of equity, we are living with the impacts of unjust urban development policies and practices. Last year, the city sponsored the YWCA's Undesigned the Red Line exhibit, showcasing the history and impacts of structural racism caused by redlining. What key urban development injustices come to mind for you both, and how are cities taking action to undo them? I, the, I think the reason I'm hesitating is that there it's so many different areas where there's uh, in, injustice. <laughs> um, I mean, I think a lot of a lot of it comes from. I, I, I'm just thinking back to um, a research project I work on worked on where uh, I was looking at um, uh, pedestrian amenities in the suburbs, mm. right? Um, and um, some neighborhoods uh, in the Sacramento area where I was doing my research had these elaborate path systems built into them. They're beautiful, right? They were designed in the 50s. Um, you, uh, you as, a, as a child, could get to school without ever uh, interacting with a car because they built wow. bridges and tunnels and these elaborate paths connecting all the schools in the neighborhood, right? Uh, and then uh, I was comparing that to a neighborhood uh, nearby uh, that was much more low income. Uh, it was a sort of... Uh, uh, primarily Hispanic uh, and black neighborhood, and uh, they did not have these amenities. Um, it was, uh, but the city tried to add them in later. Uh, to their credit, they were trying to solve this problem. Uh, so they had a they had a discontinued rail line. They tried to add these paths on the rail line to try to connect the neighborhood. Uh, and, and you know, and again, the hearts were in the right place. There was this rail line was sort of a scar between the neighborhood, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think they did this. 20 years ago now after when I was evaluating it and it still didn't make a difference. <laughs> like it still has not like sort of seen that sort of weaving together of the neighborhood that they like to see. Um, and uh, people are not using it to the same extent that they do in that neighborhood that had it from the get go. So that's a really depressing way to say <laughs> that it's challenging. I mean, like it it's really hard to go back uh, or, and, and sort of right all of the wrongs of the past, especially if you're just using infrastructure as a tool for doing so. Um, I don't, I wasn't privy to the actual planning conversations that went on when that new path was put in. Uh, but I, I imagine that um, at the very least, it's going to take more time and perhaps more outreach to really see that be seen as a, a resource the community can use. Yeah. I mean, to, to also to your, to, to your research, I remember asking like, you know, like how, how you can like, inf like we have like this idea of in field development, how we can like in field other um, ways of better connect 
different neighborhoods. So that's one concept that I that I was thinking when you were doing your work. And but then but then that the one thing is to to add something more, but then other is to remove something that is so permanent. Like yeah. like think of uh, urban freeways, for example. That's something that that I've been uh, thinking more recently. And then, if you look at the examples of, of the, um, there's a there's an uh, urban freeway uh, removal movement, for instance. But then, uh, there are only a, ha a handful of examples of where or when where that has happened. But what we see actually over and over is uh, uh, funding, like federal funding and state funding, being put on on you know like in, like. Uh, added more lanes right. and and increasing, improving uh, road infrastructure so we can get faster to our destinations uh, without really thinking on all the negative aspects of of doing so. Right. Yeah, and, and to add on to that, uh, I think one of the challenges of like, say like adding an amenity uh, to a neighborhood that's historically not had one is that you run into the gentrification problem, right? Like where uh, all of a sudden this amenity exists and now this neighborhood is a lot more attractive than it used to be. And the neighborhood I'm talking about, uh, it's a bike path. It goes right to downtown Sacramento. That's super nice for commuters, right? Like there's a certain upper middle class person who rides their bike, uh, who would love that neighborhood, right? Um, uh, and I don't know if the fact that it's not a success is almost a good thing in the sense that like it still remains like a local amenity as opposed to one that sort of would gentrify the neighborhood. And, and how do you sort of deal with the, the concerns around gentrification? I think when you do bigger projects, I've heard mixed reviews for having policies that would somehow, um, you know, uh, set aside uh, land for new development for affordable housing, things like that. You need to figure out a way essentially to manage the income challenges associated with adding amenities. Otherwise, you're just creating another problem. Uh, and this is why city planning topics are so uh challenges are so difficult is like yeah. you sometimes you're solving one problem but you might create two more this is one of the biggest dilemmas actually of the profession nowadays yeah yeah interesting well you know we talk about adding amenities um and there has been recently a focus on shrinking cities uh so areas that have undergone you know population decline economic disinvestment um, and Columbus, on the, on the other hand, we're growing, you know, we're adding more amenities, we're in the midst of city building. So what advice do you have for cities like Columbus that are experiencing and planning for a tremendous growth? Yeah, so my, my answer here, this comes from my, my background as a, a long range planner, is to have a good plan. I mean, it's, it seems obvious, of course, the city planners are gonna tell you this, but a, a really solid plan built on the back of community support the whole way through and the local elected officials believing in that plan and implementing that plan can go a long way. Now, I don't know uh, how it's how the political situation here is in Columbus. I've only been here a couple of days. I haven't had a chance to, to take the temperature yet, but that's what I would say to Columbus is like, if you have a good plan, and by good, I mean, one, again, that sort of is, uh, been sort of tested in, in, in by a large number of people of various communities, but then also is both aspirational and doable. Like it has to be both, which is a really tricky line to, to walk. And that's one that when I was sort of drafting these plans, I, I, you had to figure out like which, where are we going to go and put a, a policy in place that seems unattainable, but is a good goal versus one that is like, just needs to happen right now. And where that comes from, again, is good community leadership, right? Where uh, can these elected officials, uh, can the planning directors kind of get behind and will last multiple administrations because these plans last for a decade, two decades or so before they get rewritten. Um, so that is the conundrum. But I would say I, the cities that have, uh, have mastered how to handle growth, the ones that have planned for growth and the ones that continue to revise their plans as growth occurs. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another challenge of long range planning is that you think that you're going in one direction, but five years later, you're actually over here now, mm -hmm. right? So do you have an effective mechanism for revising or amending that plan? Are you willing to sort of, you know, have a flexibility built in that plan so you could be over here and that's still relevant? So that gets, I don't want to go into a whole hour long plan making discussion, <laughs> um, but I think that it all starts starts with a plan that everyone or as many people as possible can agree with. Manuel? I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Having a solid no. plan to, <laughs> as we plan for growth. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, the plan, the, the, the long-term plan is definitely like the, like, like this uh, important um, tool is like the blueprint to, that you follow to the future. But then, but then we have other tools right. in our toolbox 
that help us, you know, to implement the plan. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would say that that's something uh, uh, very important. Yeah. And and again, like like the zoning code is one of those. Uh, like having economic economic incentives to develop the city in a certain way, and and all these other different uh, elements that we that we used uh, as planners in order to 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 guide the city and to uh, in a way influence the market so it generates the urban form that we that we um, believe the city should follow in that master plan. Yeah. Can I, can I add on to that too? Yeah, Sorry. absolutely. So I think another thing beyond the plan is having a mindset in the community that we believe in like adding more people to our community. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, California, California, where I'm from, is a big growth state, or at least it was up until recently. Um, and the part of the reason it's not growing anymore uh, is because our communities have decided that we've grown enough, we're big, we're big enough as it is, right? And that changes the whole mindset. But if if Columbus is growing, um, and you think it's a good thing, you need to put that on your sleeve. You need to be a welcoming community to new people, right? Uh, you can't, you know, pull up the drawbridge now that you're here, right? You need to open up the welcome wagons, right? So figuring out uh, how to get that mentality across as a community sort of vision and as sort of like a state of mind that yes, we want growth. We're welcoming people to this community. We believe in this community. We believe it gets richer when more people come and join us. Uh, and I don't know, again, the best way to do that, but it comes, I think, from talking to neighbors, from de demonstrating that like you are sort of here for the resurgence of Columbus. And that means uh, more people because more people are more resources, more assets, and not just like money, but also like volunteers, perspectives, like all of these things so just continuing to have that growth mindset and don't don't have an idea in your head that yes columbus is growing but oh now we're now that we're at this population level we need to stop we've reached the per there is no perfect population right yeah, yeah. no the right question like what is it this what, how how we want to 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 accommodate that growth like what is this, what what is more sustainable in, yeah. in, in many ways Absolutely. I definitely thinking about not just the planner toolbox, as we referenced, but also the mindset behind that initiatives as well. Um, and speaking of this toolbox, you know, we, it, one of our tools is our zoning code, right? And we've never really zoned a city to be beautiful per se, um, but Columbus is in the midst of modernizing its zoning code. So what are some successful elements that you've seen in other cities zoning reforms? I know a lot of cities across the country are turning to their zoning codes right now to modernize them and update them, some which haven't been touched for decades. Yeah, so I, I think the thing with zoning reform is to not think of the not think that there's any one thing that you can do to fix zoning. Um, mm -hmm. Zoning is a complex tapestry of policies and uh, and sort of requirements. Yeah. So there's no silver bullet out there, right? So I think the best strategy for revising a zoning code to make a city more beautiful is to think about 10 different solutions, mm -hmm. right? To get you a little bit of the way there um, and don't expect to hang your head on any one of them. Uh, you know, for example, I mean, I think the ADUs, we're seeing lots of cities very much uh, more open to allowing ADUs in single family uh, residential neighborhoods. That's a good thing. But then other people turn around and say, well, yeah, but only like, you know, a few hundred ADUs are approved every year. That's not going to solve our housing crisis. Uh, accessory dwelling units. Yeah, sorry, accessory dwelling units, granny flats in your backyard. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, yes. So, uh, you know, people will say, well, that's not really worth it. It's only going to be a few hundred units. Yes, but we have to sort of get the mentality of improv comedy. Yes, and. Uh -huh. we need, yes, and this, and this, and this. And pretty soon we end up with hundreds, thousands of units. If your goal is more housing, which if you're a growing community, it should be, right? So um, thinking about it that way, I think is really important. Um, so yeah, there's not any one, uh, one sort of solution. Other thing I would think... Uh, consider is not just getting the policy right, but making sure it can be um, taken advantage of by like say developers and things. Uh, the city of Portland, Oregon, for example, did a really progressive zoning code rewrite. It was called the Residential Info Project. Mm -hmm. And they allowed duplexes on every single lot a uh, single family lot, uh, three and four plexes on almost all lots, and in some cases, six plexes if you're doing two units of affordable housing on there. And they found that actually in the first couple of years, they only had about 100 units built. Now, like I said, some of that could be just the fact that that's not the only solution to the problem, but they're also finding that uh, developers, for various reasons, weren't able to actually take advantage of these additional unit, uh, ad additional unit allowances, in part because of other parts of the zoning code, because the zoning code is so complex and everything sort of relates to each other. So they started loosening up on other requirements 
conditions uh, to allow for more housing. So they had to have a residential infill 2.0. So again, it's an ongoing process. It's a lot of different small changes and you have to sort of experiment to see what's gonna work well in your community. And what I like about the example of ADUs, for instance, is in a way is, is is starting a conversation about density that is is so controversial in some neighborhoods because you know like when we speak about density or transit oriented development like all these uh, these terms are associated with high rises and 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 they are not necessarily welcome in many communities and we we live in Berkeley I mean uh, <laughs> it, it was like almost like like something we should talk about. We have a we have, in Berkeley just we had a, a high capacity rail station in in North Berkeley. Yep. They yep. wanted single family homes around it. Like that's the most ridiculous backwards concept. But I'll, sorry. Yeah. No. And actually, I I remember reading the New York Times uh, once uh, like this fight uh, between like it was a neighbor who wanted to like to 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 build like a second story or, like do something, and then the other neighbor was complaining about like his tomatoes in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> like like things tomatoes, tomatoes right <laughs> yeah so anyway so my point is that we can create density in many ways and and density doesn't have to look in certain ways that we are um, against or, or or that we fear it will just like create all these like it has all these like negative effects of of my own property or in my community and so that's one 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 interesting aspect of, you know, I like talk about density and yeah. giving uh, a few examples of, of how it looks like, and how it shouldn't look like. And then the other, the other important element of, of zoning reforms is parking minimums. Yeah. That even though, I mean, I, I do agree with, with you, Dave, that, that we shouldn't have like, uh, like, like this is my recipe, my recipe to follow. Uh, however, parking, even though like for some might be I guess boring uh, is, is so important because yeah. because you know like minimum parking requirements is what actually uh, drives uh, building housing building cost up, mm -hmm. and has been one of the main barriers or I mean one of the barriers uh, for uh, developing affordable housing. Yeah, no, really, really good, and and it just shows all the places that the zoning code touches parking housing typology, but also how complicated and interwoven all of those things are. Um, but I'm going to think of your approach, Dave. Uh, think of it like improv comedy. So, um, But now we're going to move on to questions from our live stream and in-person audiences in just a few minutes. Um, so if you have a question, please make your way over to the microphone now. And if you're watching online, please type your questions into the chat. And before we take those questions, I have one more question for you both. Um, and this has to do with AI. Uh, it's being deployed in more new and creative ways. So do you see AI being used in city planning today? How do you see it evolving into the future? And then do you see it as a help or a harm um, in the city planning space? Um, well, I, I would like to make a difference first of like AI is, is a fast growing field. And then we have like the general, you know, artificial intelligence, that umbrella term or mm -hmm. technology, but not like very recently we, we have now what's called generative artificial intelligence that's driving most of the conversation. And so in planning or like in our everyday life, like we've been interacting with, uh, you know, with AI with, for instance, if you use Netflix, uh, they have AI algorithms that just like select what we should uh, see. So my Netflix profile might be, I don't know how different it will be from Dave's uh, Netflix profile, but <laughs> it, I bet it will be different because you know, like the AI algorithm is, 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 is deciding what I should see. Now generative AI is using the whole internet so we can use this chat box Mm -hmm. to ask questions and then generate content. And what I would say is that we've been using AI, using artificial intelligence, machine learning models, and other um, classic, yeah, like, like mostly machine learning models to, to classify data, to make more informed decisions, like for instance, how to predict traffic conditions, how to predict, um, yeah, land, 
development patterns and all these uh, variables that we care about. That's We've been doing that for a long time already. But the question is, uh, and I would throw this to Dave, <laughs> generative AI is, is, is I, I would say, uh, like something a little bit different in a way. Yeah, so I, I'm a, yeah, I think like all of you, we're sort of waiting to see how this plays out a little bit. And it's hard to get in front of something that's moving so fast. Um, I will say that, you know, there are sort of possibilities that could be really cool with generative AI. I mean, um, this is a, a bit of a dirty secret in the planning community, but um, uh, a lot of the actual policies and implementation programs that end up in a plan are borrowed from other communities. Um, so sometimes when planners are like, I need to write a complete streets uh, policy, what does the city down the road have in their plan, right? And you look at it and like, well, they implement, they passed that plan with this policy and nothing burned down, you know, probably is an okay policy, right? So we as planners tend to look at other communities and borrow, but guess what AI can do even better, right? We can say, can you just draft a complete streets policy? It scours the internet and puts together a synthesis of all the complete streets policies and gives you one, right? Carry in a way, but at the same time, it, it, you could also argue that it's a more efficient use of the information available. So, well. yeah. So the thing that we then cannot lose, though, is our critical thinking, right? So when that when that policy comes back to us, we need to be reading it really closely. Um, and that's the one thing I find a little disconcerting is currently it's difficult to know where they're pulling the information from. Um, mm. But if you're if it's I think a helpful first draft tool for planners actually physically writing a plan uh, because it can actually do some actual good research and synthesis for you, but then it's up to the planner to decide, is that a good policy? Is it reflective of what we heard from the community here? Um, you know, but it can, it can shorten some writing time. And this is just an example. Um, you know, so we're trying to, in, in, in our classrooms, uh, obviously we don't want them using AI to do their homework because they need to develop that critical thinking. Um, but we're also like, well, in the, in the real world here, you might find this a useful tool. So how do we sort of find places where we can use it? Thank you. And I, I think that's a really good point in that although AI can do so much for us and be a great tool and service, we still need to maintain our critical thinking skills as we shape whatever that tool spits out. Um, well, thank you both so much. Uh, really great conversation. It's CMC's longstanding tradition to take audience questions. So Doug Buchanan with the CMC is curating questions from our live stream audiences. And for those of you with us in person, please join Doug over at the microphone if you haven't already. And out of respect for others, please keep your questions brief and to the point so we can get to as many as possible. Please also keep in mind that questions do end with a question mark. Doug, what's our first question? Belkus, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to today's panelists. Um, Belkus, you mentioned in your introductory remarks the appeal of Santo Domingo and its density and diversity and character. Uh, question for Dave and Manuel, what are some of your favorite cities and their best aspects and why? I get asked this question a lot and it's really hard to answer um, because I think, you know, the, there's a... Um, there's a book, I forget the title, like, I think This Is Where You Belong, I think is the title of it, um, that really talks about sometimes the best cities are the ones we're just, we live in, are the most familiar with, or where our families are from, or where our memories are made. Uh, so I have not visited every city in the world, so I can't tell you some sort of definitive, like this is the best city in the world. Uh, I can tell you that some of the places I've lived, I've lived in, had the fortune, good fortune of living in Portland, Oregon, which is sort of a progressive planner's haven. Uh, and it really is a delightful place to live. I've also lived in New York City, which ultimately wasn't for me, but is fantastic in so many ways. I mean, I think my standard answer for just like, places I've visited and I've been really positively surprised by is Washington, D.C., if we're looking at a U.S. example. Um, I really enjoyed uh, sort of that urban environment. The transit's pretty good for a city that size. The museums are free. I'm a big museum buff. Uh, so I really enjoy like sort of being in Washington, D.C., but for me, it's the places where I've, I've lived and been to. So I'm going to give a shout out to Sacramento, California, which is a, a historically maligned city, especially in California, but uh, it's a great family town. The trees are magnificent and it's just like a cool people. It's also, uh, if I might just give another pitch for Sacramento, the, there was some sort of study done to see what is the most diverse and integrated cities in the United States. So a, a high level of diversity in terms of uh, race and eth ethnicity, but also how integrated are they versus segregated. And Sacramento is like a top three city for being so super diverse and integrated. So something to hang our hats on in Sacramento. Um, so I don't know. I, I have lots of favorite cities. 
Yes, that's a tough one because as, as David was mentioning, like I have like uh, all these good memories of the places that I've lived, including Los Angeles. That's that you know like that that, that some people either love or hate. Um, so if I think of the places that, that where I've lived and I have good memories, I could just like relate to the city, but because of the memories I have uh, with the people and the communities that I used to belong to. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are those cities that I have not lived, but I've visited even for short periods of time that I have great time, uh, you know, like getting around, biking, uh, enjoying beautiful uh, open spaces, parks, uh, restaurants, diverse, uh, yeah, diversity in many ways. And one is, for instance, uh, Copenhagen is one of those places that I really like. Um, I do have to say that I just I moved to Columbus uh, a few months ago, and I really like Columbus. Um, but again, and, and I also feel that every time I visit a new city and I go to a different place, I have I start like getting a better sense of how the city on, not only looked like for me, but it, how the city f is felt or experienced by other uh, uh, residents or visitors, and that also shapes a lot. Uh, my, I would say my ranking or perception of what's my favorite cities or what I look in a particular city. Yeah, I think one thing I recommend to students, my students, is if you have the means and ability, travel to different cities. Because I think, you know, obviously, like if you're somebody who thinks about cities, as soon as you go to a different city, you start to make comparisons, right? So you learn a little bit more about that city that you're visiting, but it also tells you more about the city you live in now. And I think some cases can make you appreciate it more um, and maybe it becomes even more your favorite city. So uh, just to add up. Or go to the, to the same city different uh, different times. Yeah. <laughs> like San Francisco, one of those cities that I fell in love when I when I moved to the states, and then and then. But I've been going over and over again, and I just like feel different, very different every time. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jerry Rampill. Question about the monstrous parking lots around big box stores, shopping centers. I'm doing an informal poll. I'm waiting for one to be half full. Normally it's 20 or 25% and just an awful lot of asphalt. Yes, so to, to that Thank question, you. yeah, so to that, to that question, um, I think that's one of the areas where if you are working on the Columbus zoning code, you might want to just revise your parking requirements for those sorts of places. Uh, another dirty secret of planning is parking requirements uh, for certain uses were often uh, written or designed many, many years ago before the advent of Amazon and online shopping. Uh, so the idea that the, the maximum number of cars you would need for a big box store is quite different now than it used to be. And we're not even seeing sort of like the peaks during Black Friday shopping that we once saw. So uh, of course, I think the, the the number one thing you can do is probably just eliminate parking minimums anywhere for all uses. Uh, but at the very least, finding some of these most egregious uses and transforming, uh, changing them to make them uh, more uh, tailor-made is better. You'll be surprised to, for instance, learn how many uh, parking spots you need per a volume of water in a swimming pool. Or, I mean, there are, there are different uh, rule of thumb. Uh, how many parking spaces per bowling alley? <laughs> you, know, you know, like our alley in a bowling alley, yeah. yeah. There's this professor from UCLA called Donald Shub who dedicated his entire life to study parking. And he, and yeah, he took a long way for, for planners and the public to, to understand where these parking requirements come from, what's the science, if there's any behind what we still have uh, these days. And I think that that's what's also sparked uh, uh, like a reform, like a, in, the zone, in many zoning codes around parking. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Josh Knight asks, uh, even though Columbus is landlocked, we are rich in waterways. How should these factor into creating the city beautiful? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think, I, again, I'm not as familiar with the urban form of Columbus, so I don't know what access to your waterways you have. Uh, what's that? Rivers. Rivers, yeah. So uh, is are there highways along your rivers or no? No, we have a beautiful park system that runs through downtown. You that's can fantastic. kayak hang out, walk, 
Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Uh, so it sounds like you guys are already doing a lot of the right things. I mean, I think some of the biggest transformations we see around urban waterways where they went, where they remove things like freeways, uh, which were built along sort of these these riverways. So the fact that you already are sort of taking advantage of that is great. Um, I mean, I've seen lots of great examples. Like I think it's like Oklahoma City has a really nice little like uh, canal system. They're sort of trying to do the the San Antonio Riverwalk thing, but they're sort of like even kind of quasi artificially, but it still is being successful. I mean, I think the question, the person asking the question is right to be thinking about water because there's something sort of fundamental about water. We're all sort of drawn to it, and we want to be around it, and the sound of it, and the cooling aspect, and all these reasons to be around water. So the fact that you have parks here already is great. I think the other thing I would just add is make sure there's sort of activity nodes, right? How do we get people down there more often? Yeah, how to activate those spaces, and and and, and is, it, is it the water, is it safe to be in, that, in those uh, bodies of water? That's another question, and because and, it's not only appreciated, you know, like from a, uh, yeah, like standing and, and and just like seeing how beautiful it is, but how we can use it as uh, the amenity. And I think that's a, a, another question. Yeah. Hi. Um, yes, I'd, I'd like to ask about blighted areas and how you would address that. Um, in particular, here in Columbus, Ohio, we have the Sullivan. Sullivan Avenue, Avenue is about, you know, a mile and a half or so, and it's like, you know, the crime hotspot, big time, like commercial sex and drugs and rock and roll. Uh, but uh, are blighted areas necessary in urban areas? And if not, how do we change that? Ooh, uh, I'll start by saying they are not necessary. <laughs> um, um, and I think that they are, I mean, I'm not an expert in, in that particular matter. Um, what I would say is that they are uh, caused by many other social problems that I think might be even like beyond uh, city planning. Uh, however, I've seen connections uh, in, in, in even like in, in academic, uh, in academic uh, papers on, for instance, the lack of affordable housing and, and the homelessness uh, crisis in many, in many cities that we tend to, you know, like associate with like these, uh, these areas. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I, I, the whole thing with cities is that um, a lot of times we end up being like the the stopping point for all major national and statewide challenges. Like uh, the crap rolls downhill in a sense that like we as a as a country don't have a strong social safety net, for example. So the, a lot of these challenges around housing, uh, the folks who need it the most fall at the local level, even though this is a very national problem, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's some of that is difficult. I would say that one thing I would warn against is uh, if you have a blighted area, don't just demolish it, right? Like we've learned that lesson, <laughs> right? From the urban renewal, focus on the actual problems. If crime is the problem, solve the crime problem. Don't think that like the whole neighborhood just needs to disappear for it to get better. I think that's the first step. Yeah. Yeah, like in Bogota, for example, where I where I live uh, in Bogota, Colombia, where I live a uh, uh, long time ago, um, there was like one of like these pockets of of you know like drug uh, selling. They, they were selling drugs and prostitution, and you know like was like a very dangerous area also to go. Uh, so what the city did is they they demolished many of the buildings. So guess what happened? A new hotspot emerged uh, nearby because because that's not the root of the problem. Uh, so, so yes, I, I just uh, second what Dave just said. I try to understand what the problem is and 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 and, and why is that uh, happening? Not necessarily like why is it happening in that place, but why is it happening? Anyways, yeah. Hi, I'm Margie Pizzuti, and thank you so much for your insights and perspectives. It's really been valuable. I have a bit of a pivot, maybe, on the question, and it relates to this growing concept of the 15 minute city or community. And it's not about just going further out from the city and building houses, but building a whole community that is within 15 minutes with all the amenities and all of the advantages. I wondered what your thought was on that as it relates to City Beautiful. So I as somebody who is sort of in academia, I like sort of get a little bit like 
weird around like brand named urbanism. So like the idea, like the brand name 15 minute cities or like, you know, like strong towns or new urbanism, like there's different ways. Like, so these packages of urbanist ideas that I'm like a little bit like, well, I'm going to take the best ideas from all. I think that's the, 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 I, the basic concepts behind 15 minutes cities is a good one though. I mean, I think it's another way of saying sort of mixed use development. Um, you know, like the idea that we would allow businesses to be near people where people live, the idea that you can go to a doctor's appointment, then go pick up your prescription and then go shopping and then pick up your kids at school and go home all within a 15 minute walk or bike ride. That's just, that's just mixed use development. We've been talking about that for a long time. Um, so if this, packaging uh, breaks through and gets more people convinced to do it, that's great. Um, but I, I don't know, to me, it's not a new idea, but it's one that I think is challenging. But again, zoning code reform, if you were doing it, like it starts at the zoning implementation level, allowing it to happen. So you guys are in the right spot. Yeah, but to the to the concept of, of or, or this brand of the, the, the 15 minute city uh, concept or brand, I mean, I, I, what I've seen uh, that I never envisioned to happen is that now some uh, people have interpreted that as, as, as governments will just like uh, ask people just to stay within like this 15 minute boundary and you know, like have taken the idea to the extreme, which I don't blame anyone, well, you know, like- It's the conspiracy theory, right? It, it is, it is, yes, but you know, like, like, but that's the problem of like branding something and created like something as simplistic as, as just like, you know, like, like just leaving, like why not 20 minutes? Why not 30 minutes? Like why to, why to refer it as a city, right? And then you, and you will, uh, the person who just like asked the question say, you know, like, uh, like it could be like this idea of like 15 minutes neighborhoods. And I bet that that was just like, just like changing the term might just like change completely that, a narrative against the whole idea of like being confined to a certain area, which is not the not the purpose of the concept. Do we answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Uh, and, do you want to follow up, or is that no, okay? No, I okay. no, I'm, I don't want to engage here. Just the one thing is that they all also call them 15 minute communities, not just a 15 minute city. So it gets to that. I think closer to that concept. Yeah. So. Exactly, and that's a, that's a, that's a good way of pivoting. You know, like the the react there to yeah good thanks thank you we have about uh two minutes for one final question um bill l asks um what is the best strategy to enhance a neighborhood without leading to gentrification that forces um existing residents to find new homes uh, so that's a tough, that's a, is there a silver bullet? I, I'll use the example from um, the author and former uh, San Francisco planning director, Alan Jacobs. He wrote a book called Great Streets. And he said, if there's one thing you can do to improve a city street, it's just add trees. And I think that, I mean, that's, uh, there is, there's a many, uh, there's many ways I could take this question. I think there's lots of social ways I could take this, but just like a very concrete example. Uh, a lot of, we see a lot of inequity around uh, like uh, heat in our communities. Uh, low income communities were not planted with trees. Um, and uh, if we plant more trees, we can see all these sort of associated benefits with having a tree. Trees do actually sort of scrub out the carbon dioxide and you are better off with a tree close to you than farther away. Like it's not like you can plant a forest and see exactly the same benefits. It's good to have trees close by. Uh, shade, protection from the weather, um, beauty, to come back, bring it back to City Beautiful here to finish. All of these reasons, just adding trees makes a big difference. And I don't think that simply adding trees will go so far as to gentrify a place. I think you could see a lot of these benefits without full-on gentrification. Yes, I mean, I think I think that uh, to understand gentrification, uh, uh, we need to understand first what are the causal mechanism behind, uh, behind uh, for instance, uh, 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 you know, like that the, that the prices of, of the cost of living in that area changes. And one way economists will say is that if more people want to live in a certain place, therefore prices will increase, assuming that the supply of housing in that place is limited. It will always be limited. But uh, if we don't add more housing in that particular place, then prices in a place that we are improving, let's say, you know, like adding uh, more uh, trees or improving you know, like adding better transit, like a subway station or something like that. Therefore, it will be more pressure, 
more demand for housing in that particular area, then prices will skyrocket faster. So I would say that it also depends. I mean, it, it, like understanding those mechanisms and the and the economics behind uh, pricing and housing makes uh, is important too. Well, to take um, it I'm getting the wrap up signal from from Doug, so that's our time. I wish we had more, um, but I'll turn it over back now to the other Doug for concluding remarks. Thank you. Focus, thank you very much. I hope you found today's uh, forum interesting. Uh, Dave, I look forward to your upcoming YouTube video on why Columbus is one of your new favorite cities. Yeah, good. Uh, I want to thank uh, our, our forum sponsors today, Moody Nolan and Burgess and Nipel. And thank you to the Ellis for its support and also the virtual seat patrons and the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream. How about a hand for all of our sponsors? And a very special appreciation to today's uh, to today's panelists, Dave Amos, Manuel Santana Palacios, and our host, Belkis Schoenhals. Uh, a round of applause for them as well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Please plan to attend next Wednesday's forum, Prescription for Change, Solving Ohio's Healthcare Worker Shortage in One Hour. Uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great afternoon. We'll see you then. Thank mm -hmm. you.